Hello, everyone. I'm Sybil Starr, and I'm here to give the astrology forecast for the new moon in Taurus that is coming up on November 15th at 1.28 p.m. at 24 degrees of Taurus. All right. So first, let us look at the chart. I'm going to screen share here. It's, I have a new... Uh, Zoom has kind of has a new screen, so I'm I, I'm still learning how to navigate it. All right, here we go. All right, so here is the new moon, uh, or excuse me, the full moon in Taurus. It is uh, on November fifteenth, twenty twenty four, at one twenty eight p.m. Pacific time. All right, so what we have here is the sun. Uh, excuse me, the moon is here at twenty four degrees of Taurus, opposite the sun at twenty four degrees of Scorpio. The new moon always occurs uh, when it's opposite the sun because we know the moon has no light of her own. And so she only reflects the light of the sun. Now, as you can see, the moon here is conjunct. Uh, this is called the part of Earth. And the part of Earth is always exactly opposite the sun. Whereas the sun represents us, ourselves, our, our higher self, and our spiritual self, all these different aspects of being. Whereas the part of Earth represents what we've come to give form to here on Mother Earth in this incarnation. It's a piece of our soul purpose. All right. And the moon is also conjunct the planet Uranus here at 25 degrees, 17 minutes of Taurus. Now, what we've got going on here as well is, of course, the moon is ruled by Venus. Um, well, well, Taurus is ruled by Venus, not the moon. Taurus is ruled by Venus. Taurus, actually, they say the main ruler now is Earth. Um, but uh, the traditional ruler is Venus and she's up here in Capricorn and she's square the nodes of the moon. Okay. Um, and the, the moon is actually also in a trine to Pluto and actually to Ceres here. The, one of the great mother goddesses, uh, Ceres Demeter. Um, and the sun is, um, in Scorpio, and it's ruled by Pluto. And like I said, Pluto is conjunct series. And you know, uh, the Pluto series conjunction often indicates the, um, um, the cycles of life, kind of knowing when it is time to let something go. Uh, and it seems really uh, uh, significant right now. So that new life can be born. We're in the process of letting some things go. And that is a big part of the mystery of Mother Earth is the death transformation and rebirth. And Ceres, of course, was the mother of Persephone who was abducted by Pluto. And there's, you know, there's a whole myth around that. And that has to do with the cycles of the, and the seasons and, um, and as well as many other things. Anyway, Pluto is still opposite uh, Mars. Uh, Mars here at three degrees of Leo. Pluto is going to move into Aquarius on November 16th, excuse me, November 19th, just four days after this full moon. All right. All right. And the sun is also in a trine to Neptune. All right. Let's see if there's anything else here. <clears throat> All right, let us go back then to re looking at uh, what does, uh, what all of this actually means. Well, I'm having a little trouble here. This new screen is <laughs> a little difficult to navigate. Anyway, so what does all of this mean? So first we know we always... We always need to look at the axis of the, the two signs involved where the sun and the moon are. So it's the Taurus Scorpio axis. And Taurus is very much about our possessions, what we own, self-sufficiency. Um, and Scorpio is about shared resources and emotional intimacy. Uh, Taurus is about simplicity and serenity, inner peace, whereas Scorpio is about the complexity of human relationships and the emotions in those relationships. So that's that's one of the there's a couple of pieces of that axis. But anyway, the moon is in Taurus and we say the moon is exalted in Taurus, meaning that the moon likes to be in Taurus. And Taurus, of course, is um 
excuse me, the moon is our emotional body and it's our inner world. And Taurus is so much about inner peace, serenity, abundance, fruitfulness, all of those things that make us feel safe and secure because uh, Taurus is very much about inner security, especially the moon in um in 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 uh, Taurus, it's a very earthy sign. Like I said, the uh, the P Venus is the traditional ruler, but many people feel like the true ruler is actually Mother Earth. Um, and because this is a, a an energy, a sign that is deeply connected to animals, plants, the natural world, being grounded and in the present moment, being grounded in the body, very much about a big connection to the body. And as I said, calmness and serenity, being the calm in the storm. And to know that when we are calm, we can then help others stay calm in the midst of the great changes that we are going through. To know that it has a ripple effect when we are calm. Just think if there's any kind of a situation that was um, uh, very emotionally charged or um, a kind of an accident or anything like that. It's the person who is the calmest is the one that actually uh, can get more done. All right. Anyway, uh, Taurus, like I said, is about keeping things simple, eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired. It's a very practical and realistic sign. And in its rulership of Venus, it has to, or rulership by Venus, um, we bring in what we value. Uh, Venus is about love. It's about self-love and love of others. And in Taurus, it's very much about self-love, self-love, self-esteem, self-confidence. Um, it's about beauty. Taurus is, is, is ruled by Venus. It's also a sign of beauty, but it's like more natural beauty. A Taurus is known to be persistent, which some might call stubbornness. So it's really important when Taurus is around that uh, if we're going to dig in our heels, understand why we're doing that. And if it's really in our highest good or if it's just to be stubborn. Uh, it's also the sign most associated with comfort, which brings in the planet Uranus because you know Uranus has been transiting in Taurus uh, for about five years. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. It's got a, I, next year, Uranus moves into um, Gemini, but it, it, it's kind of transiting both signs and, and a little bit in 2026 as well. So anyway, it's been there five or six years and um, in, in, and, and so it's pushing us out of our comfort zone is where I'm going with this. Uh, it has been, you know, Uranus just continues to push, push, push. You know, it brings in, you know, like they say, expect the unexpected. Taurus likes to be, likes to be secure, know what's happening next. And Uranus saying, no, you've got to trust the process. Um, and that miracles are in the field when we do. Uh, and to know that there are miracles in the field when we can allow ourselves to flow with the changes that want to happen in our lives, whatever they are. And it brings in downloads and insights and to know that Mother Earth and all her devas are speaking to us, that we live in a speaking world and it is our job to listen. Uh, and it's also about the energetic upgrades to the body. We've been getting them with all of these solar flares and geomagnetic storms and everything that is coming in. And our, and the thing is, uh, it, we are being asked to anchor that light in our body so that we can also anchor it in Mother Earth. Okay. All right. That's why it's so important to take care of our body so that we can align with the new light coming in and anchor it in. All right. It is conjunct. Uh, the moon, the moon, uh, the full moon in Taurus is conjunct the star Algol. It's been it's been traveling there. We're getting hits of it. Uh, uh, or, or excuse me, Uranus has been activating Algol off and on all year. And so this month is actually also conjunct the moon. And so I feel like it's a big breakthrough in the Medusa myth. And just a little bit more about her. She was the dark aspect of a triple goddess of wisdom called Anatha. She was a goddess of the Amazon women. 
and she was a goddess of divine serpent wisdom of kundalini healing blood mysteries oracle and prophecy and the mysteries of death and rebirth and the story of medusa is actually a violation of the divine feminine it's where medusa was raped in athena's temple and then athena then turned her into a monster whose gaze could turn men to stone and one of the things it always says to me is that she is that part of us that knows when something is off or wrong but do not have the power to do anything about it except give a deadly stare and those who who have done wrong know it okay well, that has probably happened to all of us at least some point in time but ultimately this is i think the, the one of the bigger points as well is that ultimately she was beheaded her head completely disconnected from her body. So she lost the instinctual wisdom of the body and the power of the Kundalini life force. And I feel like with the breaking of this myth, it is a time of reclaiming that divine feminine power of the serpent energy that runs up our, up our spine for healing and creativity. And as we become whole and claim our bodies as sacred, we heal our self-worth and self-love issues, as well as the instinctual body wisdom. Because we have been disconnected from our bodies, and it is time to fully embrace our bodies and to fully inhabit our bodies. You know, when there's trauma, we leave our bodies. And so the thing is to be able to move in these higher vibrational frequencies, we need to be in our bodies to hold the light in. And it's also about healing our relationship with Mother Earth and her body. And she has told us how to heal her. And she says for us to heal ourselves as that is how we heal her and that our bodies are a part of her body. We're not separate from her. We never leave her. You know, we are on her. Well, except when we fly and that's kind of, you know, but our natural state is to have our feet on Mother Earth. All right. And part of this is, of course, is what has been coming up uh, really in, I'm going to say in um, really recent times is coming to light is all of the poisons in our food, our water and our air. And, and, to, and to realize that the outer world is a reflection of our inner world and we are poisoning ourselves. So how could we have a healthy world? You know, we are part of Mother Earth. When we poison ourselves, we poison her. And so it's really important to uh, help. What's really important that is happening right now, I feel there is a mandate to make America healthy again and to clean up some of our corrupt institutions that have allowed this poisoning to happen. And so um, the Sabian symbol for this full moon is a large, well-kept public park. Once again, it's reinforcing that to take care of Mother Earth, to take care of our bodies, to bless her, to celebrate her and give thanks for our bodies because they are gifts from Mother Earth and to take care of them. All right. Now, the sun is in Scorpio. And Scorpio is the, uh, you know, Taurus is very much about the physical body. Scorpio is very much about the emotional body. And Scorpio is known to be one of the strongest healers in the Zodiac. And so this is also about emotional body healing. And to heal the emotional body, we have to feel it to heal it. We are in the great purification times where we are releasing old trauma, our own, as well as the collective. And we have to release the old stories around the trauma or we just keep reopening the wound with those old stories. They take us right back down that old pathway that doesn't serve us. And I also want to acknowledge that many of my friends during this time uh, post-election, they are feeling the pain of loss around this election. And I want to acknowledge that and hold them in compassion and say it is time to grieve the loss, but also keep your hearts open because this, when we, we, this could be a time when we close our hearts. And the thing is that what we need is to keep our hearts open and to know that love heals everything. And we cannot feel love or any other emotion if our hearts are closed. 
And there, the sun is conjunct a very powerful star, a fixed star. Um, it's in the constellation of Centaurus, and it is called Beta Centauri, or its more common name is Hadar. And some believe that the movie Avatar was based on Hadar and its beings. They live and how they lived in harmony with nature and all of life. Um, and that this was true. This was this was not a made, you know, it came into James Cameron's imagination, but it's it's actually a real thing that exists in our universe, um, in our galaxy. And Hadar has been deemed the star of divine love throughout our galaxy. And those from Hadar, the Hadarians, believe that love is the essence of life and creation. They value connection, communion, and creating together as love. Hadarians have a deep sense of community and have deep within them the experience of sharing the collective expression of love. We are here to serve love as each one of us is born from the divine spark of love. Hadarians bring with them the knowing that nature is divine love and that we are one with nature. They have a very sensitive heart and deeply feel the lack of love here, as there are many star seeds here now from Hadar. And I believe the Hadarian teaching is to remember the most important things are our relationships, how we value our connections, our communion, and our sense of creating together. And this is, and it, it all has to do with keeping our hearts open in this time of great change. And you just don't know what miracles may be coming. Okay. All right. And so the teaching of this star, and, and like I said, there are many Hadarians here that have come to bring love to our planet because there is, there has been a serious lack of love, but it is time for us to open our hearts and to let it grow. And the teaching of the stars to remember to keep our hearts open as we navigate these challenging times. Love heals everything. And let your love heal all of life, not just your heart, but when you open your heart and love, it, it, it vibrates out. It changes the vibration. Let your love be the light in the darkness. And I do want to uh, also share that I'm adding a new service to my um, astrology readings. Um, I'm adding uh, a combination of flower and starlight essences, essences from the stars and the flower essences, um, because it's the message that I have been getting about. I used to work with these a lot and uh, kind of bringing them back in the flower essences. The starlight essences are new. Uh, that it is a vibrational medicine that activates the light body in different ways. It goes to where we need the light, the, where the emotional block is so to bring light to it and also to help us connect with our star nation relatives. Uh, it's both. To me, it's kind of like bringing it, it's combining heaven on earth. Okay. So anyway, uh, to just to know that I'm going to, that I'm in the process of adding that. All right. Now we're going to talk about Pluto and Aquarius. Pluto is Aquarius is moving into Aquarius on November 19th, but at this full moon, it is still in Pluto. And excuse me, Pluto is still in Capricorn and it's at that anoretic degree, 29 degrees. Pluto has been back and forth over the last degree of Capricorn for the last several years. It's really tiring. And yet these, yet it's, it's kind of like, it's really focusing where the energy needs to be. Um, and the last has been really focused like a laser beam the last two and a half months at that 29 degrees and 29 degrees. Like I said, is an anoretic degree. It's a degree of crisis. It makes things happen. Uh, they call it the last chance saloon. Okay. In the, where you, like the the if you haven't gotten the teaching yet you're going to get it now and pay attention all right and so uh and and of course um you know what it, i think it has been doing is to bring to light the corruption here uh, on mother earth those in power and our country and around the world uh the decay of our governmental institutions causing them to break down at their own foundations because the actual system itself is crumbling and it's important to remember that when pluto transited sagittarius 
uh, and Sagittarius rules religion. Uh, during that time, we saw the pedophilia scandal in the church emerge with with Capric uh, Capricorn rules, the bones that hold up our civilization, the uh, government, uh, the banking, the medical system, all of the systems, okay? And this, the decay of our institutions causing them to break down. And so this is what has been going on. But we are entering, it's the breakdown of the old paradigm, and it's been really painful and really hard. I told someone I feel like I've been through a war over the last four years, and I know our country has been at war or been involved in war in other countries, but I certainly have felt it. But I do feel like we are entering a new paradigm and a new era when, with Pluto in Aquarius. Okay. And so, and, and the thing to remember is 29 degrees of anything, it is really just like pulling teeth. I mean, it is really hard, but when we enter into the, the early degrees of the next sign is like a fresh, it's like a rebirth, a fresh birth. Okay. So anyway, Pluto enters Aquarius on November 19th. We'll be in Aquarius until 2043. Um, and we have had a taste of Pluto in Aquarius over the last couple of years, but now it's going to be there completely. And the last transit of Pluto through Aquarius was during the American and French revolutions. Massive shifts in the, uh, what happened then was massive shifts in the collective consciousness and the rights of the individual. It was desire for freedom of the individual and the rights of the individual, which leads to a free society. And the United States was based on that. It was built to be a, a free society. I mean, not completely, you know, we, we still had problems, but better, more, much different than any of the other civilizations that were on earth at that time. Okay. Other than indigenous civilizations. All right. Anyway, Aquarius asks us to be true to ourselves and to think for ourselves. It is the archetype of the heretic, the maverick, and the rebel it is at the cutting edge of thought, always five years ahead of everyone else. Very visionary. And over the last 30 years, all of the other outer planets have been in Aquarius as well as Saturn. And now Pluto is the last, the last one. And this is a big quantum leap. And Pluto says, evolve or die. There's going to be, there's always, Pluto brings with it many opportunities for the shedding of old skin is the great purifier. Pluto also says evolve or repeat. And I don't know which is worse, but yes, we have to keep getting the same teachings until we learn them. All right. Pluto shows us the root causes of things and Pluto shows us our shadow. And the shadow is what we reject, what we don't integrate what we deny or project onto the world. As Carl Jung said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. And the hardest truth is that your worst enemy, the one inflicting so much pain and suffering, it's not Pluto, it's you. More specifically, it's that part of you that you cannot face. This quote came from Astral Butterfly, and I just thought it was just brilliant. I'm going to reread it. The hardest part is that your worst enemy, the one inflicting so much pain and suffering, is not Pluto. It's you. More specifically, it's that part of you that you cannot face. <clears throat> and once we can admit our mistakes and own our stuff, we can heal it when we can just own it. It allows us then to forgive ourselves and others for being less than perfect. And we can forgive ourselves for being what we see as less than perfect. We can then forgive others. And Pluto brings in transformation through forgiveness to where we can become our most authentic and self-empowered self. And, the, and so in Aquarius, it's very much about, like I said, the... Uh, uh, thinking for ourselves, being you know, Aquarius asks us how much we've sacrificed at the altar of approval of others. So the self empowerment aspect is 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 how much of ourself we've given away to get to receive the approval of others due to a fear of rejection, which is the shadow. 
Okay. And Aquarius also has a lot to do with technology. And in Aquarius, Pluto in Aquarius can take us to great heights in developing our own spiritual inner technology, as well as use of technology to aid our spiritual growth. But it can also uh, be used to take over our uh, our bodies, our minds, all of these different things. Um, you know, um, I don't want to say it like that. It can impede our spiritual growth if we rely too much on it. Maybe that's a better way to say it. But it also brings up our relationship to technology, um, especially AI. Elisa Royal Holt says that AI is actually a reflection of humanity. It is not something outside of ourselves, not inherently good or bad. It's a reflection of our consciousness and then our intention behind its use. All right. Um, Pluto in Aquarius to me is about a revolution in consciousness on a personal and collective level. Pluto is about power. Aquarius is about the people. This is about the power of the people, the power of the collective and how in, how much we can accomplish when we work together. And I have gotten involved in several groups lately that I feel are really powerful and are really helping to shift the consciousness uh, of humanity. The important thing is to keep the vibration high so that others will attune to you instead of what a group normally does is return to the lowest common denominator, which is fear. And so it can be a mob consciousness that could be a um, mob consciousness and herd mentality. It would be more of the shadow, okay, where you're not thinking for yourself. But the thing is, we can move mountains when we come together in the same resonant field, and that field can be love or fear. So our job is to remain in a field of love. All right. Next, we have Mars and Leo opposite Pluto. Okay, so Mars and Pluto, uh, they meet three times. Mars goes retrograde, and Mars goes retrograde on December 6th. Uh, and is retrograde some, sometime in mid-February. I think I have the date later in, in this report. Um, but they're still, they're dancing together that whole time. They're within range of an opposition. Um, and so they meet three times. The first time they met was on November 3rd at 29 Cancer, 29 Capricorn. And that was a really, really hard one. Okay. The next time they, their exact, their next exact conjunction is on January 3rd at one degree of Leo Aquarius. And then the third time is April 26th at three degrees of Leo Aquarius. Um, and just a little bit about Mars and Pluto again. We've talked a lot about Pluto though. Uh, Mars is the god of war and often brings conflict and turbulence into situations that are unresolved and asks for courage while showing us our direction in life and where we belong. The thing is, they say Pluto is the higher octave of Mars, okay? And we know Pluto, once again, is the god of death and rebirth, the underworld, the deep unconscious. And uh, when they come together, they can create a very volatile field with chaos and upheaval of all kinds. As, and both are the rulers of Scorpio. And this, combined with the increased solar flares and geomagnetic storms, is creating a very emotionally intense field. We're traveling through a storm, the storm that shakes everything up, but ultimately clears the path so we can see our way forward. And remember, the moon is in Taurus, and it's about putting those roots down, you know, and let the storm swirl around, the emotional storm swirl around. Eventually, things will calm down. The key for you is to stay centered within yourself, okay? And to know what you might experience, there might be some power struggles, a battle of wills with another person, which is really a battle within your own self to align your egoic will with divine will, which is your soul plan or contract, which is always aligned with love. We may also see power struggles happening on the world stage as those who have held the power on many levels may not release it willingly. Um, well, I mean, there's Let's put it this with power factions may be having power struggles. We may be seeing it in the outer world and we may experience projections put upon us or the other way around others projecting, projecting onto others. 
Many of us have issues in expressing anger and aggression or dealing with heated confrontations. Um, we may ask ourselves how we can reclaim our power and assertiveness ex and express our anger in healthier ways. And if we can channel that Pluto and Mars both have to do with the, how we use our will, our egoic will to align it with divine will. Okay. But it's still our will. And if we can channel our willful drives toward achieving a worthwhile goal under Mars Pluto, rather than projecting the focus of power onto someone or something outside of ourselves, we can move mountains. Okay. But of course, the question is always, are we moving the right mountains? Because they both have to do with our desire nature and can certainly take us completely off track. All right. All right. Now, Mars in Leo. Mars in Leo is a much different energy and it is at the beginning, not the end. So what we're having at when once, and I'm going to say, even though Pluto is still in Capricorn, but just for a few days, and we're not going to see Pluto in Capricorn again for another 248 years. Okay. So, you know, we're not going to be alive. And uh, so it is dying gasps are going out, but in the process, it's coming into Aquarius at zero degrees, which is a fresh energy and Mars is moving into Leo and a fresh energy. So this is a dance of fire and air, which is much different than the earthbound water and earth. Fire is spirit and air is breath. So we inspire, it is an energy of inspiration. Okay. All right. So, um, and like I said, Mars is, is Mars, uh, went into Leo on November 3rd. It goes retrograde on December 6th at six degrees of Leo where it stays until mid, uh, February. I don't think I did write the date down mid February. All right. Anyway. So, um, the Leo Aquarius axis is Leo embodies this spontaneous, playful awareness at its most dynamic, creative, and, and uh, self-expressive. And Aquarius is very much about the principle of understanding and confers objectivity and discernment. Okay. It is about the individual versus the group, the personal versus the collective. And I feel like this phrase that really encompasses the uh, Leo Aquarius axis is uh, namaste. The light in me recognizes and honors the light in you. You are another me. Okay. All right. So Mars in Leo is asking us to, first off, first let's just talk about Mars retrograde. So when Mars is retrograde, things do kind of slow down a bit. And I think we get, we get to direction, we get guidance on our direction in life. Our direction may be shifting. And so to be able to go with the kind of the, you know, the slowing down um, and kind of thinking things through also Mars retrograde asks us to think things through, be like think before we speak, before we jump in, Mercury is going to be retrograde at the same time. So, you know, uh, are part of the time. So it's really important to think before we speak and to know that we might be having a, um, a change in direction, put it that way. All right. So it's have the courage to let your light shine. I think this is the most thing. It is really how we light up the world. Mars in Leo provides a surge of bold energy, lighting up every part of light. This cosmic shift boosts our confidence, courage, and motivation, pushing us to go after what really matters with passion. And it could be a relationship or it could be a um a, uh, you, you know, your career, your vocation, your calling, you know, wherever Mars is showing up in your chart, it's important to look and see because that is the direction it is wanting to take you. All right. Uh, uh, Mars is a planet of action as charismatic energy, creating a powerful force that encourages us to chase our dreams, speak our truth and dive into new experiences without hesitation, except for the fact that Mars is going to go retrograde. So yeah, we will need to hesitate. Okay. A new way forward is showing itself. The struggles that we have been in have been more about releasing the past, but now it is more about creating the future. 
Now, Mars will go back into go retrograde back into cancer. Um, and so I think there will be some healing processes that need to happen before we can go full steam ahead. But I feel like, uh, see, let me see. I'm, let me see here. Mars. Let me just look this up real quick. So Mars goes retrograde, like I said, uh, December 6th. It goes direct again at 17 degrees. It goes remove, It goes back into Cancer on January 6th. Oh, wow. Okay. Hopefully we're not going to redo that one. Oh, God. Um, or even rehash it. But we could. Uh, because, you know, Mars in Cancer has a lot to do with safety and security as well. People feeling safe and secure. Uh, whereas Mars in Leo's is a much bolder stroke. So uh, Mars goes retrograde until February 24th, where it goes retrograde or it goes direct at 17 of Cancer. And it re-enters Leo on April 18th. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the progression. But anyway, uh, so... But Mars in Leo, it just this is where we are right now. Like I said, it's a new way forward. It's a very creative time. We are creating a new world. And so the creative juices are flowing and they're active. And it's also, I feel like about a warrior of light coming out of the, or going into the darkness. It's the warrior of light that is going into the darkness. The thing is, is to allow your light to shine brightly because that's how we light up the darkness. We will light up the world with our brilliance. And, you know, it's like, don't let the opinion of others block you. Aquarius, ask us how long I have sacrificed at the altar of approval of others. And as we shine, our light into the darkness and chaos. It will help others find their way. And as we know, too, the light is what starts to give things form. Um, you know, where we focus our thoughts. All right. It is about a heart mind coherence and the activation of the higher heart. And as we shine our light in the darkness and the chaos, we'll create order and a new world with our minds aligned with our hearts. Okay. And it's also important to know that we are, uh, Pluto is going to be conjunct the stars of Aquila, uh, all of 2026. It's, it's there right now as well. And as we know, the eagle is the only bird to fly into the storm to be able to rise above it. And it's also about hearing the celestial call of our soul mission, while Mars and Leos gives us courage to act upon it. I was just at a group yesterday where there was a channeling and the channeling was saying, what's, what's your role? What, who are you in creation of this new world that we are bringing in? Everybody has a role. Everybody has something to do. And we're really being asked to have the courage to stand up and follow our soul mission. All right. Now we also have Saturn goes direct on the day of the full moon on November 15th. And when Saturn is stationary, uh, when, when, when Saturn um, goes stationary direct where it is at the uh, full moon, its influence is amplified, making this a great time for moving stuck projects forward. As Saturn goes direct, things are going to start moving again, maybe a little slow at first. Uh, like I said, but then we also have Mars retrograde. So we have that whole thing as well. But Saturn, when Saturn goes direct, you can really feel that shift in energy. Um, and it's all telling us also it's important to slow down so we can hear our inner voice and our inner guidance. Now, Venus is in Capricorn and is square to the nodes of the moon. And Venus is the ruler of Taurus. Venus in Capricorn is loyal and practical. And she talks about taking relationships seriously. You know, as we move through these challenging times, know that our relationships are one of the most important things to help us keep our hearts open and to stay connected with each other. And the thing is, our relationships may need some work after the election to take them seriously and have the courage to do what needs to be done because we need each other as we move, as we make these big shifts. All right, Mercury is in Sagittarius and the retrograde zone. 
Mercury goes retrograde from November 6th, 26th to December 15th in Sagittarius 22 to 6 degrees. All right. So when Mercury is in Sagittarius, our, our mind becomes more imaginative and explorative, our communication more colorful and engaging, our perspective of the world broadens, and we begin to see the world through the lens of possibilities and adventure, that we are actually in a field of infinite possibilities, and it's about seeing the big picture, starting to see how things come together. And of course, uh, all the usual uh, retrograde cautions apply, you know, um, it's not a good time to sign contracts unless, unless you have to, and then, you know, just pray over it because sometimes it is what just simply needs to be done. Things slow down, communication slow down. And I feel like because it's allowing us after this here in the United States, after the election, to start to get a different perspective, um, starting to see the big picture, maybe that you can't see when you're in the midst of all of the, the chaos and the emotion and start to see openings where doors were priorly closed. All right. And then the last thing I want to talk about here, I'm going to screen share again. All right. And this is the, the Pleiades. All right. So our son, so right now, as we're transiting through November, December, January, February, these are the times to see the Pleiades. And this is a picture. I like this picture because it's kind of cloudy because that's how they look. They actually call it a nebula M45. And um, they say there's hundreds of stars in here, but we call it the seven sisters because there's seven brighter stars. Stars. Okay. All right. Um, and so anyway, the, uh, those from the Pleiades have been involved with Mother Earth and humanity for millions of years. They are known as our cosmic cousins and that we share much DNA with them. Bashar says it's the Pleiadians that are going to be making first open contact. And they're already starting telepathically. I, I really feel their presence, their energy. They're very close to us now. They tell me that they are here now and they will start making themselves known to us. And why they are coming in such great capacity now is because they are emotional level healers and they are here. They are coming to help us heal our hearts. The Pleiadians teach us to keep our hearts open during these times of great change, for it is through our hearts that the new earth will be born. It is through the, our love and compassion uh, for ourselves and others that we will enter into unity consciousness and a higher frequency dimension that is known as the ascension process and the shift in consciousness that we have been anticipating for, for a long time. The shift is here. We are in it. It has already started. And we have help from all over the universe. Uh, but the Pleiadians are some of the ones that are closest to humanity that have been involved with the evolution of our consciousness for many millions of years. All right. So, all right. So, I just want to say thank you all uh, for watching this video. And if you are interested in a reading, please, my information is in the description box. Uh, and you can contact me through there. And if you like this video, please check like and subscribe. It really helps me a great deal. All right. And sending many blessings and namaste to all.